Hello, welcome you all to the lecture series in political theory. I am Professor H. Srikant and I will be talking to today on Gramsci's understanding of uh, the intellectuals and the party. This lecture is further extension of uh, my previous lecture on Gramsci's theory of uh, state and hegemony. In the previous lecture, I told you that according to Gramsci, every social group that seeks to come to power should be capable of exercising hegemony over subordinate and allied classes. And this hegemony should continue even after the revolution, even after the working class comes to power. By now, it is clear to you that uh, by hegemony, Gramsci did not mean domination. Hegemony refers to intellectual, moral and political leadership. Hegemony brings together different subordinate classes under the unifying leadership of a dominant class. This much becomes clear to you if you have seen the my previous lecture. But the question is who will do this job of uh, ensuring the hegemony on behalf of the state or the dominant class. Here comes the role of uh, intellectuals. Who are intellectuals? Or who can be called intellectual? How are they different from non-intellectuals? How do these intellectuals come into existence? Do the intellectuals constitute a separate class or social category? Do all these intellectuals think and act alike? Or do all of them have the same class point of view? How do or how should the intellectuals engage with the people, classes or social movements? What role do they play or should they play in the society or social revolutions? How do or how should the working class look at the, the intellectuals? Should the poor people who are fighting for a, a more humane and alter, uh, alternative society, should they take the help of uh, the intellectuals or despise them as armchair intellectuals? Good for nothing. These are some questions which agitate uh, our minds. Actually, some of these questions were crucial to the Marxists also. To be frank, initially even Marxists did not have a clarity or unanimity on how to deal with the intellectuals or what role we should assign to them in the socialist revolution. You know Marx and Engels who together laid the foundations for Marxist philosophy 
they themselves were intellectuals. They were not from the working class, but they could give birth to a philosophical outlook or a vision, a political vision for the working class. And they were accepted as leaders of the working class. But does that mean that every intellectual who talks about socialism and working class be accepted as a, a communist or as a leader of the working class? This question became very prominent during the Second International when the socialist parties in the Europe were filled with uh, several intellectuals coming from petit bourgeois background but proclaiming themselves to be Marxists. True, they had the knowledge of uh, Marxist literature, they were very articulate and they were able to quote from uh, Marx and Engels on any topic they knew much more than what an ordinary working class uh, uh, person knows about Marxism or Socialism. And actually these people used to dominate uh, the deliberations in the party. But many of them, because of their background, they lack discipline. And they acted as if they were above the working class. They were talking about the working class. But they did not identify themselves as part of the working class. It was during this period that Lenin came out uh, with the idea of a disciplined vanguard party of a professional revolutionaries. He thought of a building the party based on the twin principles of a collective leadership and a democratic centralism. So, Lenin made it clear that not every intellectual who talks of Marxism can proclaim himself a communist. He was not against the inclusion of intellectuals coming from other backgrounds in the party, but they should prove worthy of it. by declassing themselves and by subordinating their individual interests to the interest of the proletariat, party and revolution. He thought of the party or he entrusted to the party the responsibility of uh, organizing, educating, and leading the proletariat and other working people. This theory of Lenin was further elaborated by Gramsci as part of his own theory of hegemony. To understand uh, uh, Gramsci's uh, concept of individuals, let us start with uh, what he says about uh, manual and mental distinctions. You remember my lecture on the theory of state and revolution, where I told you that the communism 
will aim to put an end to the distinctions between mental and manual labor. You know, in history, as the society advanced from a, the primitive stage, the division of society necessitated separation of uh, manual and mental labor. Although both are equally important uh, for the human existence, those who were engaging predominantly in mental, la la mental labor, they come to acquire a higher status in the society compared to the manual labor. And actually they started looking down upon others who are engaged in manual labor. Actually, Gramsci questions this dichotomy and argues that there is some mental labor involved in everything branded as purely manual. And vice versa is also true. That is, manual labor is also there in the so-called mental labor. Some manual labor will be there even in the activities which are considered as mental labor. For example, you see, if the masons, carpenters, potters, etc., if they have not used their mental labor, we cannot have beautiful homes, furnitures and pots. In the city of Shillong where I live, we come across loaders carrying almeras on their backs and walking up the hills. They could make it by adopting a particular technique which reduces the strain on the human body. That means the loaders, that is the men who carry loads on their backs, they also have some mental labor. As such, everyone who are considered as manual laborers are also capable of some mental labor. Hence, Gramsci says, we can talk of intellectuals, but we cannot talk of non-intellectuals. Non-intellectuals do not exist. From here, we, uh, Gramsci comes to this uh, conclusion that all men are intellectual, but not all men in society have the function of intellectuals. I read it out again. All men are intellectual, but not all men in society have the function of the intellectuals. Nobody is a born intellectual. It is the division of labor which allows some to become intellectuals and makes others peasants, artisans, laborers, capitalists, etc. Here, Gramsci is asserting that there is nothing intrinsic about being or becoming an intellectual. You will understand this if I 
give an Indian example. You know, in traditional Hindu society, only the Brahmins were considered as intellectuals. And they used to look down upon other castes, castigating them as stupid, incapable of understanding higher ideas. The Brahmins forgot that they could acquire intellectual power only because some others, the peasants, artisans, weavers, washermen and Dalits etc. they were doing their jobs. It means one could be or become intellectual because others have taken up a jobs or vocations. In that sense, even intellectual, this is also a kind of job. Without understanding this material dimension, several intellectuals tend to boast, saying that they have attained attained intellectual status only through their sheer hard work and because of their intellectual ability, innate abilities. That is what uh, Gramsci contests. Now let us come to his understanding of intellectual. Before that, uh, I ask you, tell me, who is an intellectual? What will be your answer? I think, I presume you would say intellectual is one who read or who read more books, who knows many things, including about God, or who talks eloquently or who grows beard like me. Isn't that? But <laughs> Gramsci contests this commonsensical understanding of uh, the idea of intellectual. In his opinion, to quote his own words, the mode of being of the intellectual no longer consist in eloquence but in active participation in practical life as constructor, organizer and permanent persuader and not just simple orator. So he is saying don't think that just because somebody speaks eloquently, eh, you, uh, he automatically becomes an intellectual. What is necessary is uh, that uh, he should play a positive role in the society. Construct, organize, persuade and articulate. But what is it that uh, he is constructing, organizing, persuading or articulating. That is the hegemony of the dominant class. You know there are many social theories which looked at intellectuals as separate social category with the distinct identity and interests. But Gramsci thinks that intellectuals are not a separate class, but they are part of one or the other classes. To quote him, every social group creates together with itself organically one or the more strata of intellectuals 
who gave it hegemony and awareness of its own functions in social, economic and political fields. Capitalists have their own distinct technicians, economists, cultural organizers and legal experts. The dominant class needs to select intellectuals with the capacity to be an organizer of society in general. Unlike the main classes, the intellectual usually work in the sphere of a superstructure. In that short pair of uh, Gramsci tells many things uh, which uh, many he mentions different characteristics of uh, intellectuals. What do they do? By extending the class hegemony, the intellectuals unite the people and give them identity. And those who are intellectuals, uh, whom you call as intellectuals, uh, their nature and their role may differ from society to society. In bourgeois society, the intellectuals include wide stratum of people, engineers, economists, artists, media professionals, uh, politicians, administrators and legal experts. These intellectuals need not be capitalists themselves, but they do identify with and work for the bourgeoisie. Some may be very close to the economy, some little far, but all of them work at the level of superstructure for the extension of the bourgeois hegemony. Depending on the nature and quality of work that they engage in, Gramsci classifies the intellectuals into two categories, traditional intellectuals and organic intellectuals. Now first let us see uh, what he means by organic intellectuals. Organic intellectuals are those who belong to or who are relevant to the present times. They are closer to the sphere of production. They are specialists who fulfill technical, directive, and organizational needs. They give the class a hegemony and awareness of its functions in the society. Actually, they, the class is divided. They bring together uh, all members of the class creates a, some kind of a homogeneity and makes them aware of uh, their status and role in the society. They perform ideological and organizational functions and they attempt practical intervention to change the real world. In doing so, they elaborate new philosophy and come out with a new conception of the world. They actively participate in practical life. They are not the armchair intellectuals. It is they who, who mark 
uh, Gramsci says, as constructor, organizer, and permanent persuader. Hmm? These are the qualities of organic intellectual, closely in touch with the class with which he identifies himself. Hmm? In contrast, we have the traditional intellectuals. By traditional intellectual, Gramsci means those who stand for essentialism. In this, we can include people like clergy, rural intellectuals like priests and teachers who have a little connection with the existing modes of production. Then they keep aloof from the people. They always consider that they are autonomous and independent uh, uh, social group. They think that they are above the people. Mm? They know more than uh, other people. So they actually also live in the past. They glorify the past and consciously and unconsciously work for degenerating or degenerated classes. You can see such people even in India talking about the glory of uh, ancient uh, India or the glorious days, uh, days in uh, the colonial past. Such people. Hmm? So this, uh, it is, is it that they are not intellectuals? They are intellectuals, uh, I think. But actually they might have been even organic intellectuals at one point of time. But they did not keep pace with the change. They, stag they got stagnated and have become more armchair intellectuals today not relevant to the society at large. Now, this being the general understanding of intellectuals, now the question comes, how are these intellectuals relevant to the socialist revolution? Can, you know, in bourgeois democratic revolutions, be it French Revolution or American War of Independence, and also in what Gramsci calls the passive revolutions, where the social change is brought from above by the dominant classes. In both these kinds of uh, revolutions, the intellectuals have played important roles because of their economic, social and educational status. In feudal and capitalist societies, it was possible for individuals to emerge as intellectuals. They had property, they had support system and they had access to schools and books. So utilizing all, some emerge as intellectuals. Sometimes such intellectuals also get the state or the ruling class patronage. But how is it possible for the proletariat to create its own intellectuals? The proletariat, you know, they are poor, 
less educated and not resourceful. Prior to the socialist revolution, even they cannot expect any state to patronage or promote these intellectuals. Who will then work for extending the proletarian hegemony? That's the question. It is here that Gramsci emphasizes the role of uh, the proletarian party. Gramsci assigns to the party the role of uh, securing hegemony. He securing the hegemony of the proletariat in philosophic and in social fields. The party should act as a collective intellectual. That's what he says. The party should act as a collective intellectual and articulate the interests of uh, the proletariat and extend its hegemony over other laboring masses. While making efforts to develop organic intellectuals, the proletarian party should make an effort to create organic intellectuals from among the working class, peasantry and other laboring classes. But at the same time, the party should also make an effort to win over the traditional intellectuals from other classes and make even those traditional intellectuals into organic intellectuals. See, it's a very interesting thing. So he sees that there is a part of traditional intellectuals who can be won over by revolution. As the class antagonisms intensify, huh? some of the traditional intellectuals also get inspired by the socialist revolution. And they work, they empathize with the working class and work for a revolution. Such people, the party should identify and win over them. And despite you know, these varying backgrounds of uh, these intellectuals, all should work together and undertake the responsibility as theoreticians, organizers, builders and persuaders and extend the working class hegemony essential for the socialist revolution. And this is something possible because he earlier said there is nothing like a non-intellectual. Even these workers, they uh, uh, can uh, be made into intellectuals. But that task has to be taken by the party which should act as a collective intellectual. Some Western scholars have interpreted this Gramscian theory of uh, intellectuals and the party as something diametrically opposed to Leninist ideas. Some of these scholars have projected Gramsci as father of what came to be known later as uh, Euro-Communism. On their part, those who call themselves uh, marxist Leninists, they also disowned Gramsci based on some writings which appear to be different from Leninist understanding. 
But my own understanding is that Gramsci remained faithful to Leninist idea of uh, the vanguard party and that his idea of intellectuals and the party only added more flesh to Lenin's project. We should not forget that Gramsci was in the Soviet Union, Soviet Russia for two years prior to his arrest and advocated Leninist type of insurrection in Italy. Hence Marxist Leninists should take his writing seriously, although he might have uh, differed on certain issues with the Soviet leaders uh, and Soviet policies. Again, although Gramsci spoke about intellectuals and the party in the context of uh, the working class movement, I consider that his theory can be extended even to the movements of uh, other marginalized communities fighting for their legitimate rights. That includes uh, the movements of the women, Dalits and tribal people in India. If you observe some of these movements, uh, you can see two kinds of trends. In some movements, we find persons not belonging to the community, projecting themselves as leaders of the community. Although they never live with or integrate with the community. On the other extreme, we also see in the name of identity politics, the community leaders taking parochial stand, casting doubt on the integrity and commitment of the persons belonging to other communities and believe that only the intellectuals coming from within the community are authentic, reliable and they alone are capable of uh, understanding or representing uh, their community interests. Here, the Gramscian position takes the middle path, which emphasizes both on the creation of intellectuals from within the communities and at the same time winning over the and working with intellectuals coming from other communities. And both working together in an organization for the benefit of uh, the working class or other marginalized communities. Further, Gramsci's theory makes it clear that quoting from different works, talking eloquently and writing books are not enough to call someone as a good intellectual. A good intellectual is one who is organically linked with the class or the community and plays the role of connecting, educating, organizing, representing and leading the community or the class for promoting its, their respective interests. You know, when we encounter persons 
quoting Marx and Engels, we often get this doubt whether they are really communist intellectuals or not. I believe what Gramsci says about the intellectuals in a way provides the answer for that. This in a sense is what I can say about uh, Gramsci's theory of uh, intellectuals and the party. Now, uh, I will give some more references uh, for those who want to know more about uh, Gramscian political theory in general. Please go through some relevant uh, notes in the prison notebooks. Now that book is available uh, in internet, you will find the entire book, you can download it. There is a chapter on uh, intellectuals mm? uh, that helps, but maybe some part of it may be difficult. So actually, uh, you can go through uh, A. Sassoon's book, Gramsci's Politics, and also Roger Simon's book, Roger Simon's book, Gramsci's Political Thought. I consulted these books when I was a student. Of course, now many more books or articles have come and some of them are available on internet. So you can look at them. So this is what all I can say about uh, Gramsci's understanding of intellectuals. If you like my lectures, subscribe to the channel and recommend it to the persons interested in political theory. If you have a difference, if you have questions, please write in the comment section. We will meet again with a new topic. Thank you very much.